Okay, we're going. Wonderful. Hello and welcome. I'm Becky. I'm with Malvern Books, and we're thrilled to have you join us tonight for the uh, book launch for Jason Mark Harris's new book, The Master of Rods and Strings from Vernacular Books. Joining with us, as well as Jason, is Lowell McWhite. Our first reader tonight will be Lowell McWhite. And then after they have both finished, after Lowell and Mark, uh, Jason have finished, then we, will, we should have some time for an audience Q&A. So if anyone's interested, you can certainly enter your questions in the chat, and then we will take those afterwards. So first up, we'll have Lowell McWhite. Lowell is the author of six books, novels, Normal School Professed, Burnt House, and The Demon Life, and story collections, Long Time Ago Good, and The Messes That We Make of Our Lives. A winner of the Doby Paisano Fellowship and a member of the Texas Institute of Letters, White teaches at Texas A&M University. Mick? Okay, good. Thank you, Becky, and thank you, Joe, for, and Malvern Books, which is a, such a great institution. Uh, everybody should go there and spend money. See, I'm going to read a little short piece from this book back here, Birdhouse. Oh, there we go. You can read along with me as I read. This is a deep eddy. In the morning, it was raining, and we ended up stuck behind a caravan of senior citizens, all in big recreational vehicles, all from Washington State, all headed south in the rain. I whipped on down the road, sliding in and out between the campers, and every time I passed someone, I could feel Amanda tense up beside me on the seat. She was afraid of the big mining trucks that were heading north. Every time I pulled out the pass, she tapped on the floor of the pickup with her right foot, searching for a brake pedal. I did my best to ignore and drive, and so I drove and I drove and I counted the RVs, 64 of them in all, I think, and I knew they all must be together because of the big red decals that each vehicle had on its rear. I drove on south, the windshield wipers thudded, and Amanda tapped her foot. Neither of us said anything. Once we got past Whitehorse, the rain stopped, the traffic seemed to let up, and Amanda was able to relax a little and fall asleep. How can you tell, truly tell, when someone's desperate? I didn't see anything then. I didn't notice anything. And if I had noticed something, would I have cared? Amanda woke up sometime later when I pulled off the road, a small white cloud of dust blowing up around us. When it cleared, I could make out an overflowing red litter barrel and a tarnished length of guardrail. And beyond that, a valley. A range of mountains rose on the other side of the valley, shaded by clouds. A motor home and a mining truck went by, heading west, north, blowing in more dust. Everything seemed much drier, though there were still some muddy puddles in the gravel. Amanda frowned, half asleep. Are we there yet? Those are the Cassiers over there, I think, I said. And I guess that's the Rancheria River. Amanda looked away at the mountains. She asked, how much farther to Fort St. John? We stayed at a motel in Fort St. John on the way up. Hot showers, clean sheets, firm mattresses, cable TV, wireless, cell phone reception, air conditioning. I don't know, I said, maybe 900 miles. We might make it by tomorrow for pleasure. Amanda rested her head against the window of the truck. The weak sunlight cast a shadow across her face. She said, then let's push it. I waited a moment. I asked, are you not getting out? No, Amanda sounded serious. No, well, I well, was tired of her complaining, but I tried not to let it show. I mean, to hell with her. I shrugged and opened the truck door. I collected five bottles three Labatts and two Cokes and a wad of paper from under the seat. And I carried it over to the trash barrel and jammed it all in. The turnout was at a bend in the road at the top of a bluff. Below, beyond the guardrail and down the steep bluff, the Rancheria River twisted through a wide marshy valley and disappeared off to the northwest. Cloud shadows scudded over the valley. The cassiers were light gray, cold looking. Between the turnout and the mountains, a single cloud was dropping rain, dark gray streaks that settled into the haze. Our car with its headlights on went by, blowing dust, heading northwest to Whitehorse, Yukon Plates. I walked back to the truck and leaned in. I said, I have to pee. Amanda sighed. She didn't even open her eyes. She said, that's fine. 
The slope of the bluff was steep and somewhat slippery. It was damp but not muddy and was covered with hard pale gravels that rolled out from under my feet. I rested against a burnt out stump and caught my breath before sliding the rest of the way down the slope. At the bottom, there was a fire ring made of gathered wild stones, ashes, some beer bottles, and a half burned throwaway diaper were in the ring. Logs had been rolled up close for seats. A path led down to the river. Up on the bluff, big, a big truck of some sort headed on south down, headed south on the highway, and dust swirled on a cloud and drifted down the slope. In the silence that followed the truck, I heard the river. I bought, buttoned my jeans and followed the path, scrambling over a dead fall and splashing across a little creek coming in from the north. The creek disappeared into a thicket, but further ahead, I caught a glimpse of open water. I climbed over another dead fall, ducked under some alders, and came out on the banks of the river. The rancheria came out of the southeast, headed toward the bluff, and turned suddenly to the west. It flowed past my feet and turned on into the south, dropped into a riffle, and disappeared behind some brush. At the base of the bluff, where it turned, there was a log jam and an eddy. The creek seemed to come in there. The water below was shallow and clear of a sandy bottom. Two smallish grayling cruised the base of the pool. What pretty water, I thought. Look at those wild fish. Those grayling have never seen a fly. I'm the first man to see them. I discovered this spot. Those fish are mine. When I got back to the truck, Amanda was counting the RVs. She had my clipboard was making a mark every time one passed. Well, I got a beer out of the cooler and walked around to the driver's side and got in. Amanda said, you must have had to go pretty bad. Yeah, I was looking at the river. I twisted the top off the bottle and took a long drink. My jeans were wet from the knee down and there was a scratch on my face, but I didn't care. I said, I saw this huge grayling. I want to see if I can catch it. Those old people from Seattle just passed us, Amanda said. She tilted the clipboard so I could see it. There were a lot of marks, most of them, maybe all of them. They blew dust on me. We'll pass them again. I said, they drive slow. Yeah, and they'll slow us down. I'll go catch that fish and let him get ahead of us. I tried smiling at Amanda, but she just stared at me. Look at this, Amanda said. Again, she held up the clipboard of all the marks and slashes on it. Okay, there were a lot of RVs on the road. I could see that, so Amanda could count. I'll be just a minute, I said. Come on, Amanda said. You've caught enough fish already, okay? I looked away and been digging through a pile of maps on the seat between us. Amanda asked, okay? No. I found our battered copy of the Yukon guidebook and started thumbing through it. I looked up, no, really, this grayling is enormous. First I saw two little ones and I saw the big one. He's never seen a fly before. Nobody's seen him before. It's like a whole new world down there. Sure, Amanda said, right off the road. Yeah, I said. I thought of the fire rig and the diaper, right? There were people here somewhere. People came here, passed by here, stopped here, littered here. But there wasn't anyone here now except me. So this is my spot. Mine. I discovered it. I was an explorer. I said, isn't that great? Amanda turned away from me and looked out the window. Two more clouds were dumping rain somewhere near the mountains. I found our place in the guidebook and I started to read DC 663.4. Hey, I was wrong. We're about 600 miles from Fort St. John, 663 from Dawson Creek. Amanda still didn't look at me. She said, well, let's get going. No, wait, I said. I began reading again. DC 667, four more miles already? DC 667, litter barrel if you wrote view of the Rancheria River. That's where we are. We have a GPS, Amanda said. We already know where we are, so let's go, okay? No, wait, Rancheria River, fair to good fishing for bull trout and grayling. Well, I guess the grayling are here at least. I looked up. You see this grayling, hun? It was huge. There's no such thing as a huge grayling, Amanda said. It's way bigger than any we saw in Alaska, over 18 inches easy. Amanda shifted her seat and turned to face me. She reached for my beer and took a sip and made a face. It was warm. We were out of ice. John, she said slowly, choosing her words carefully, I'm really tired. I'm even tired of looking at trees, you know? Everything looks the same. We've driven something like 8,000 miles in the last, oh, no, I said. Come on, really, it's more like about 6,000. Okay, so it's six fucking thousand. I don't really care. I just want to get to wherever it is we're going today, and I want that to be a little bit closer to home than we are now. I mean, I guess, I don't know. She sighed, very dramatic. She said, fuck. I looked over her and tried smiling again. I guess I was a phony because I didn't care. I just smiled. I showed my teeth, phony. I even took her hand and squeezed it. I said, this is what I want to do. It will just be a few minutes. This fish has never seen a fly before. Amanda pulled her hand away. You don't even keep the damn things. Catch and release, I said, all the way. 
I got out of the truck, shut the door, and leaned in the window. You want to get out and watch? No. Sure? Yes, I'm damn well sure. I took a step back. So she was pissed. So what? I had a right to do what I want to do, too. I stepped around to the back of the truck and looked at her through the layers of glass, and I thought of the trip out. Prairies, plains, grasses, rivers, badlands, rivers, mountains, rivers, trees, rivers, trees, bridges, trucks, mountains, glaciers, more trees, more rivers, good roads, bad roads, old people on RVs. Ten days from Austin to Anchorage, two weeks in Alaska, and now we are still at least a week, week away from home. She was tired. Of course she was tired. She was pissed off, too. But being tired and pissed off wasn't going to wasn't going to get us home anytime sooner. I had a right to do what I wanted to do. And right now, I wanted to go fishing. I went around to the window and I said, we'll get there fine. You know, Amanda said, it would have been a whole lot easier if you just left me back in Whitehorse. Then I could have caught a flight home. You could dick around in the woods and play fucking Lewis and Clark all you wanted. Oh, come on, I said. But I thought, tell it her. So she was tired and pissed. It'll just be a few minutes, I said. Then we'll come back and drive like hell. We'll pass the old people. We'll make it fine. Amanda said, I don't think so. I didn't say anything else. There wasn't anything to say, really. I walked around to the back of the truck again. I looked back at her and saw, saw her take another sip of warm beer. And I saw her twist the rearview mirror around to watch me. After that, I ignored her. I dug around in my fishing gear and I pulled out a rod, a fly, bag, fly box, some gadgets. When I looked up again, I saw a man to pour the rest of the beer out the window. When I got into place, the river came straight at me, then turned, the main current curving toward the south and back into the east. I was a little off to the side of the eddy where a small current circled around and around out of the main river, burbling up against the bank along the sandbar the creek had deposited under the log jam and back out into the main current of the river. It was pretty water, clear and cold, and reflected the sky, the trees, me. The water seemed pretty deep. I tried looking down through the reflective sur surface, and even in polarized glass, it's going to see deep, greenish shallow shadows. This is probably the place where the fish in this section of the river spent their winters, fitting around under the ice and snow, hold holding in the dark, waiting for spring and break up. Then I saw the big railing float up out of the green. I watched it get bigger and bigger, watched it suck down a bug, a grayish tan caddis fly of some sort. The fish made a little slurping noise and settled back a foot or so in the water. Two other smaller grayling appeared and hovered off to the left. They could all stay in the eddy as long as they wanted, and the river would always swirl food right up to them. And I thought, this is why I came on this trip in the first place, to see this, the river, the mountains, the everything. I thought, this is the way life is supposed to be, always. This place, this water, these fish, everything new. Yeah, I stood there watching this fish a long time. Then I took a breath. I stood holding my fly rod with a little fly called an Adams, bushy and gray, tied at the end of the leader. I stepped to the side to put more of the uh, bush between me and the fish. There wasn't much room to cast, to cast, but I didn't need to cast far. I worked out a little line, a slop roll to cast into the eddy. The leader straightened out just enough and the fly dropped softly onto the water. Nice, I thought. Rayleigh look up. They like to eat insects off the surface. Good. The Adam sort of looked like a caddis. That was good. I held my breath. And then it was very easy. The Eddie brought the fly to the big Rayleigh, who spotted it, rose, fitted back in the water for a second, looking at it, then sucked it down. I set the hook. The shock Rayleigh jumped, bored up to the main river, quickly jumped twice more, then again, and tried to go deep. I was using a heavy leader, though, and I pressured the fish, keeping it near the surface. One more jump. It was really easy. I knelt over the panicked fish and picked it up. It was slick and iridescent, gleaming in the sunlight, green and bronze, heavy and fat. It gasped in the air, trying to breathe. The big dorsal fin was swept down, but I ran my finger along it, pulled it up. The big, big fin. I measured the fish against my rod and it covered the riding wire right up to where it said five weight. So it was, maybe it was 18 inches long or maybe 19. Easy 16 or 17, 20, if I ever felt like lying. I tried to work fast. Took out my cell phone and took a quick picture of the fish. Then I removed the fly and got the grayling back in the water, holding it by the tail. In a minute or so, the fish wriggled and let go. I let go. It shot back into the eddy, into the shadows, and went deep. I stood looking at the water. And it was then that I realized that back up on the bluff, Amanda was leaning on the truck horn. And I guess I just missed it. I climbed up the bluff, breathless, and got to the guardrail to turn out, and she was gone. 
My truck was gone. There was a battered Chevy pickup with Yukon plates parked there and an old fat guy with a big head of white hair and a gut spilling out between suspenders standing next to the truck. And there was the overflowing trash barrel and some muddy puddles in the gravel with some of my stuff scattered around. But Amanda was gone and my truck was gone. I stood there breathing, trying to breathe. My fly rod pointed out behind me toward the river. The fat guy said, I guess you're the boyfriend. Next to one of the puddles, I saw a duffel bag that held it that had held a lot of my fishing gear at the ice chest. Some of my clothes strewn around too. She said you were down there fishing, the fat guy said. She said you were maybe lost. I was thinking about going to look for you. I wasn't lost, I said. Tourists get lost here all the time. I'm not a tourist, I said, I'm an explorer. Well, the fat Canadian looked at me and thought about that. Finally, he said, that gal was really bad. I asked, yeah? I pulled out my cell phone to call Amanda to get her back here. No reception, of course. Useless. I put it back in my pocket. What are you fishing for? The Canadian asked. Railing, I said. Listen, did she say anything? Just that you were fishing and maybe lost, and I could see she was mad. She was mad. Yeah, well, fuck that. I climbed over the guardrail and looked at my belongings. A big bag of my reels and some fly boxes and a pair of neoprene waders and boots. A pair of jeans and three or four heavy shirts tossed down on the gravel. One shirt with a sleeve trailing in a puddle. I stepped over and opened the ice chest. Four of the bats, no ice. And Amanda was mad. Okay. I took one of the beers and stepped over and leaned back against the guardrail. Opened the beer. The big Canadian was looking at me. The breeze ruffled his white hair. A pair of RVs headed south close together and dust rose up from the road. Behind me, the river, the Cassiers. Well, the Canadian said, I guess that gal just ran off and left you. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> that was great, Vic. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> so next we will be hearing from Jason Mark Harris. Uh, Jason will be reading from his new book, and let's see. Uh, can we change the uh, video to Jason, Joe? I don't know if I can. Let me try. Oh, here he is. Okay. Jason okay. Mark Harris graduated with a PhD in English literature from the University of Washington and an MFA in fiction from Bowling Green State University, where he served as fiction editor of Mid-American Review. Creative work has appeared in journals such as Apex and Ab Abyss, A Royal Literary Review, The Offbeat, The Saturday Evening Post, and Writing Texas, among many others. He teaches creative writing, folklore, and literature at Texas A&M University and College Station. Jason? Thank you. Appreciate that very much. Appreciate being here. And here we go. Part one, page one, Master Rods and Strings. I will not deny that I have always been fascinated with puppets, perhaps because I was born on a farm in saint Simeon, a forgotten town west of Valence in southern France, named after the patron saint of puppets. Despite the frequent puppet shows, many families consider themselves extraordinarily lucky if a child were accepted into the Lycée of Alsay, the Marionette, to study such puppetry. Not all were enthusiastic. Neither my father, Patrick Clermont, nor my mother, Anne Below, ever bought me a puppet. I sulked over this injustice. At the age of four, I could only watch my sister, Sonia, play with Angelique, a fairy marionette with long red hair that our Uncle Pavon had bought her. Occasionally, when she noticed me moping, Sonia would let me pull at the strings. Although I could get Angelique to do a flopping walk, I never could make her glide gracefully as my sister did. Sonia's twirling flourishes of thumbs and rippling fingers gave Angelique life. Such talent, such polish, Uncle Bavon rubbed his thumbs together as he watched Angelique slide amid potted plants in the garden and float up to the doll's house to join Sonia. She played the strings like a harp by whose invisible sounds Angelique moved with buoyant grace, almost hovering at times as if, as if her delicate azure wings could truly fly. Uncle Bavon's own prowess at puppetry was marvelous. Some whispered he could literally bring puppets to life. He took a dedicated interest in Sonia's future. That is why I have so few memories of her. She left for the advanced arts of puppetry. I was left alone. I longed to play with Sonia as we had on brighter days of jumping on piles of autumn leaves or racing through fields with the spring winds, chasing harvest mice and swallowtail butterflies between stalks of shuddering wheat or corn. 
When I brooded and stroked Sebastian, our silky furred black cat, who had also been the playmate of Sonia, I decided that if I showed myself particularly adept at puppets, like my sister, then I would be reunited with her. Despite father's refusal to buy me a marionette, <clears throat> though I bawled for one during walks down cobblestone streets in the marketplace of San Simeon, Uncle Pavon, who was half Italian, brought back from a summer trip to Italy one of its most famous puppets, Gandua. Uncle Pavon's passion for puppetry extended to his purse strings. He spent much wealth to sponsor children to master the arts of rods and strings. As Uncle made Gandua bend and hop about with herky-jerky motion, I laughed. My father scowled, but then accompanied Ganjua's antics with violin. Once I began dancing, father smiled. Look, Elias loves to dance with music, he told mother, who smiled thinly back at him. But it was not the music that made me laugh, jump, and frolic. It was the puppet. This new marionette looked sharp in his black coat with red fringes, and the Ferrari family, most famous of Italian puppeteer dynasties, had added dark blue trim to the red and blue tricorn hat that sat upon the puppet's frowning and sour face. That red button-eyed grimace made the mannequin look like he must be about to speak. And speak he did, though only in my dreams, since Uncle took Goanjua away with him. I can show you how to really play the violin, the diminutive Ganjua mouthed at me in a dream, upon a beach of black sand beneath red lights that spiraled into an indigo sky. Play we did. Together we sawed and wailed across the stage where insect-headed people chirped and countless puppets of every shape and size and color hummed and sang. Before sleep, I imagined the nightly concerts. I'd stare at my bedroom wall, which would shiver with grainy but vivid phantasmagoria. Two years later, my father, stooped of back and callous of chin, proposed to teach me the violin and waking life. He was astonished to find my uncanny facility with the bow. Ganjua plays even better than you, Papa. He shows me how at night. Father gently adjusted my right arm. Ah, but he does not hold the bow properly. My improper posture continued to vex my father, but he was always patient with me because of my impeccable sense of rhythm and my powerful feelings that occasionally surfaced in a rousing crescendo or heartbreaking diminuendo. I remember one day as I pined for Sonia, he told me to use my melancholy on the strings. You're already good, but you can be a great musical performer, my boy. You must harness your passions. Now that elbow, keep it under the violin. Yes, better, better. Ah, you make each note sing. It's as though the boy feels the strings right up his bones into his ribs and heart, father told mother, who didn't look over at our practice sessions while she sewed up a ripped cravat for one of her few clients. She pressed her thin lips together. Let the boy be what he is, no more, no less. So you said about his sister, father's smile collapsed into drooping marionette lines. Mother did not even glance at his crumpled face. She stared out the window at the corn and wheat bending beneath the evening breeze and the setting sun. We had not seen Sonia in six months. Father explained this was no mystery, but the result of her prodigy. Since Uncle Bavon had remarked her facility with puppets four years ago, and as a star pupil of rod and string, she worked tirelessly at puppetry. She was free from the daily struggle between dirt and shoot, thread and seam. I listened to Sebastian's purrs for some inkling of when his mistress would return, but he at least seemed content to wait. The first snow would be coming, and my heart beat in a frenzy of disappointment, as I feared that my sister would not join me in building a snowman. She did not come home for Christmas or Easter. With coward's eyes, my parents evaded my questions about when she would return, putting me off month by month. No gifts could replace what they'd stolen. In May, the flower petals blew. Alone, I chased after them. Only breezes caressed me. Meanwhile, father, who practiced more than ever, baggy eyes, redder from sleepless nights, still attempted to make a musical genius of me. But he observed a disappointment and peak that I preferred make-believe with invisible puppets rather than work with a violin. Sure of foot, I liked jigging about to the music rather than performing it. And when I played the violin, I pretended Ganjua and his grand puppet audience delighted to watch me. Walking home from school through St. Simeon's narrow streets, I'd gaze with longing at grinning and pouting faces that looked out from puppet shops. Once a month, the Carnivaux de Marionette played in town, and I'd sneak away to watch and wonder at how their handlers could perform such miracles of movement. I also shadowed local daily street shows. 
One of the street puppeteers named Eve was amused by my devotion. He gave me a memorable lesson there among the dark blur of gray cobblestones. The life of puppets, he said, untwisting the strings of his marionette menagerie, is the dance of the fingers. Puppeteers of old, they say, would connect wires from their veins, feeding lifeblood to puppets to entice the spirits of the earth to enter them. Today, we do this with strings. You move like so, and he moves. A thing is dead until it moves. You bring it life. I listened to his macabre words and wondered if he meant to scare me with this tale of bloodthirsty puppeteers. I was far from afraid. In fact, I longed to enter into that secret communion of puppets, like those marvels the legendary past. Eve twitched his knuckles, and the horse marionette rose and clip-clopped across the road. After a half hour of imitating Eve, I began to get the trick of it. Eve clicked his tongue. You could be something one day. You must keep at it. One night, after the full moon bloomed yellow over our blotchy and stunted wheat stalks, Uncle Bavon brought Sonia for a visit after her twelfth birthday. She did not join me in racing through our miserable crop. She preferred to sit on the couch with Sebastian. Sonia petted the cat while listening to Father play the violin. After rushing through Debussy, Father set down the instrument and bemoaned the moldy winter wheat, which had followed the summer's blighted corn. I asked Sonia to show me what she had learned of puppets. I didn't bring one, my dear little cabbage, Sonia said. She smiled, but sadly. Her slate gray eyes did not flash with the spark I'd seen in our childhood games. Never fear, my children, Uncle Bavon boomed. From his billowing overcoat, he drew out the fairy dancer, Angelique, with which Sonia had demonstrated her virtuosity years ago. Those butterfly wings flashed azure, and Angelique's eyes shone orange with speckled topaz. Her red hair complemented her violet dress but I noticed the front of her head now had silverly, silver, silvery blonde bangs that matched my sister's own hair color. This similarity made me long to stroke that puppet's hair, to make friends, maybe even to kiss this strange cousin or little sister of my own. I looked at my family to see if they shared in my delight at seeing Angelique, but my sister's face tightened and my parents looked away. Uncle Bavon stared at me, not Sonia. He pulled forward the diminutive butterscotch hand of the puppet and pinched one of my blonde locks, which my mother had let grow long, hating to cut them, she said. I winced at the stinging tug on my scalp. Angelique's topaz eyes looked at me, almost cruelly, I thought. Uncle Bavon released me, and I saw how in one quick movement, Angelique's delicate palm brushed against his own large free hand. So many gifts with this boy. Sebastian, swishing his tail stiffly back and forth, watched the proceeding warily from his bed of straw in the corner of the dining room. Angelique needs a dance partner, Uncle Bavon said. Pick up the strings, my talented boy. I brushed my rumpled hair across my forehead and then took hold of the perch that guided the marionette. I gyrated my wrist to flap Angelique's fairy wings, but I pulled the strings too hard. Angelique toppled over, startling Sebastian, who sprang up to the kitchen window and leapt out. You see, Elias is not one for the puppets, father snapped. Whether directed at me, mother, Uncle Bavon, I could not tell, but shame and anguish boiled inside my chest. Uncle Bavon looked at me and slowly pulled his mustache. I began to cry. Maybe not, or maybe not yet, he rumbled. Let's see him with the fiddle then. Sonia patted me on the back and whispered, it is far better not to be for the puppets. I bit my quivering lip and blinked back tears of wounded pride. Father shoved the violin at me. I played his dispirited march, a half step at a time. By the time I finished, Uncle Bavon had drunk half the bottle of wine, had stopped touching his mustache, and clapped cheerfully. Father did not clap, his jaw clenched and bulged. Mother refilled Uncle Bavon's glass, then her own, and avoided looking at both her husband and Uncle Bavon. Sonia, Uncle Bavon said, his ruddy bald head gleaming with a glaze of sweat. Let us see Angelique dance, truly. With her face dipped in shadows of the flickering lantern, Sonia bit at her thumbs, then picked up Angelique's perch. Without even bothering to unwind the string, she whisked her fingers in an elegant curl while drawing up her wrist. In a rippling pirouette, Angelique rose and spun about the center of the room. My tears dried as I stared at my sister, so magical and wonderful, an actual fairy herself. While Sonia's fingers spun like a spider cocooning a hapless fly, Angelique performed a gliding acrobatic and mesmerizing waltz. Sonia's own feet slid quietly over the floor. She wore flat, black ballet shoes that Uncle Bavon must have purchased to help her technique be flawless. 
When Sonia had finished, Uncle Bavon bellowed, isn't she tremendous? Father and mother stayed quiet. Sonia looked at her black shoes. Why had she come home so glum? I have worked so long in that dance. It would be a wonder if it weren't pleasing. Ever so modest and practical, Uncle Bavon said, but you see, she is ready to tour. Talents such as hers should not be for St. Simeon alone. Father opened his mouth to speak, but did not say a word when mother pointed at Sonia. You're bleeding, mother said. Just my thumb, Sonia sucked at one, then the other. Angelique's perch also had flecks of blood from where Sonia's bitten thumb oozed on the polished wood. No, mother pointed to the back of Sonia's dress, the red splotch that soaked from her groin down her leggings. Sonia's eyes were watery and her face blanched when she rushed to the bathroom, paling like a ghost nearing its dawn dissolution. Mother followed her. The rest of us waited till mother and my sister reappeared. Still pale, she looked down her flat ballet shoes as if some secret answer lay between them. Mother frowned. Please, you must keep her better. Sonia is not a little girl anymore. No, Uncle Bavon said, his broad thumb stroking the base of his chin. She is not. And you've come to take her even further away from us. Can she not at least visit more frequently? Father's bloodshot eyes glared at my jovial uncle. Pavon, hands folded behind his back as he paced the room, spoke as if lecturing to an audience at the theater or advising an official committee. Although her early childhood was enriched by the wholesome earth, farm life does not permit full dedication to the art. Her fingers would lose their subtle feel of strings and rods. Tutors from all over the world work at our school and Sonia is their most prized pupil, as she is mine. It is no exaggeration to say that young Sonia and her puppets will achieve truly unique greatness. My chest swelled in pride for Sonia, but also poignant jealousy and longing at not yet being able to join her. I missed her terribly, and I craved truly unique greatness too. But why did father's hands shake and mother's knit more furiously while uncle spoke? Father stretched his lips in a wan smile. Noble of you to take such interest in her career. Pavon stopped pacing. He held our father's gaze. It is a good month before her first tour, a monumental step in her progress. To fully prepare her, I will teach her all that I know of the grand arts of puppetry. All that you know, gnarling his chapped fingers into claws, father shut his eyes. Uncle Pavon looked away from father's strangeness and out at the failed crops crackling in the evening wind. Could you keep two children with a year like this for the farm? Father opened his eyes but said nothing, a husk of himself brought in from dry fields. Uncle Bavon hummed, stepped over to me. He ruffled my hair with his broad hands. Such beautiful hair, the marvel of the golden fleece here in this age of steam and steel. He drew out his scissors and cut a lock of my hair, the same one I think that Angelique had pinched. He stuffed the sheared lock into his inner coat pocket. Something to remember, my nephew, by. He patted his coat like he'd stolen a big secret. Outside, a cat screeched in pain. I rushed outdoors to see Sebastian, attempting to drag himself up the steps to the porch. His left leg was bloodied and missing half his furry toes. As I wrapped Sebastian in a towel, my family came out and saw the disaster. Oh no, Sebastian, Sonia cried. She kneeled to stroke his quivering blood-speckled ears. It's one of those overgrown foxes that did this, father growled and clawed at his ribs. Uncle Bavon watched me pet poor Sebastian. Then he pulled out Gianjua from his coat. Why did Sonia duck as if dodging a wasp? Jealous that I finally received my own puppet present? Uncle Bavon set Gianjua on a wicker chair. Gianjua, I trust, will be of some comfort. As Sebastian yowled his final wails of anger, pain, and fear to the mucus-colored moon, father did not object that I had something to cling to. The house was no home after Sonia's departure which felt like a second death following so soon after the lethal mauling of Sebastian. Because father set traps for rats that invaded our farm now that Sebastian's watch had ended, I became accustomed to the bodies of dead rodents. I puzzled over the mystery that separated the twitch of life from the stiffness of death. When I played violin, I composed songs in D minor that were somber and dissonant. My father wrinkled his nose at the disconcerting melodies reminding me that I still had much to learn before I became a true musician. His guidance irritated me and made me more morose. Playing with the Ganjua did not distract me much from the knowledge that he too was a dead thing, 
no matter what Eve had told me of how the strings could dance a puppet to life. However, that old macabre notion of the puppet's dance of blood still intrigued me. I thought of Sebastian's still fresh corpse buried in the corner of the carrot field beneath the calmer poplar tree. Wires, Eve had said, ran the lifeblood from the puppeteer's veins to his avatars of cloth and strings. Had Sonia's bitten and bleeding thumbs helped Angelique dance? The violin lessons, not surprisingly, were doomed to come to an end. When father roared through the house upon discovering his polished mahogany instrument, stripped of its visceral strings, the last thing he might have suspected was that I had attached those strings to poor Sebastian, to whom I tried to give back life by pinching the strings between my bleeding thumbs, moving each paw one at a time a step closer to the milk dish. But even though I pricked my thumbs first with mother's sewing pins, so they bled at least as much as I had seen Sonia's. It was no good. I had heard father refer to the strings as threads of catgut, but I always thought that was an expression referring to how the violin sometimes whined like a feline. Years later, I would reflect on my failure at reanimating puppetry. I would consider that because the violin strings were not conductive metal, but mere catgut after all, that they could not transmit the electric pulse of life. Dead cannot bring back dead. My wretchedness and my technical failure was compounded by the shock of what father did next. Okay, that's the end down there that for today. So, want to read more, <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> so now, uh, Jason, so I haven't seen any questions for Jason or Mick uh, in the chat boxes yet, but I did have one that occurred to me as you were reading. Um, it, it's very interesting to me that you really have embraced this whole idea of the marionettes and, and learning from them and learning to work with them. So what was it that drew you to marionettes as the subject for your novella, for your book? Yeah, a, a natural question but one that is still sort of hard to answer, like why I thought of it when I did. Um, you know, I suppose I always had some interest in, in puppets and marionettes. My, my parents did have like a little, um, a couple marionettes and um, I had a wolf puppet growing up, um, but yeah, I wasn't any kind of puppet prodigy and there wasn't very much going on with puppets at the time when I wrote this or started to write it in 2013. Yeah, so I'm not really quite sure why then, uh, except I should say, um, uh, one of the stories by Thomas Ligotti that I uh, enjoyed quite a bit uh, is called The Clown Puppet. And it was a sort of evocative piece with regard to what might lie behind uh, this mysterious animated clown puppet that shows up to visit the narrator. And so I think that at least was, was an influence at the time. Um, it's my best estimation on the process of how it came to be. I find them kind of creepy myself. and even They're I extremely creepy. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no getting around that. <laughs> <laughs> but cool, you know, really cool. And they're amazing in the hands of a, a real pro when you watch them. They do see so, seem so alive. So that is, I, I was definitely waiting for the creepy in the, in the book. <laughs> That's a nice have... family story, really. <laughs> Well, you already have the cat and I, so that's already like, oh my goodness. <laughs> All right, so now I do have, there is a question. Oh, look, it looks like there's a puppet in uh, with Burke over there. It looks like there's a, 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 uh, punk, a gym punk puppet over there. <laughs> I'm not one for the puppets. <laughs> uh, okay, so Burke has a question and he asked, how did you research the material? Okay, so let's, let's think about that. Um, of course, <laughs> part of it was Google. Part of it was, you know, looking at some, some books about, about puppetry. I wanted to, you know, find out uh, some of the different cultures' uh, approaches to puppets. So, you know, including, you know, Java and Bali, um, um, you know, shadow puppets and um, other types of puppets. Uh, the idea of junk puppets when you can have a competition of a, uh, just sort of a mess of things and yet a, a gifted puppeteer um, 
can perform well there. Um, so I just have a combination, I'd say, of, of books, articles. Um, I didn't interview anybody, so no field work in this case, really. <laughs> Burke's very familiar with field work. He's uh, done folklore uh, research. We've done some of that together. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that's the less than <laughs> surprising answer, just the, the basic things for research. You know. Now, I don't know who this person is, uh, but the the, uh, the name that's on here is 19794. <laughs> so first, uh, there's a comment. Uh, the first story had characters that were not open-minded, agreeable, or steady. <laughs> Well, that was, I guess. They're, they're tired. I mean, they've been <laughs> locked up together in a pickup truck for, you know, for a month. <laughs> so, like they're exhausted. And people had to get cranky. That, that was the whole, that was the whole idea behind the story. People get cranky that when they're Your tired. story. Okay. Yes. Yeah. They were a little cranky. <laughs> That's for sure. I like the fact that she, well, I was I didn't like it, but I thought it was pretty funny that she finally just drove off and left. It's like, whoa, okay. She was serious. Uh, now back to Jason. Jason, you mentioned this is one. Uh, this is one of your influences. Uh, Thomas Lagodi's *The Clown Puppet* had me pondering the idea of other forces beyond mysterious puppets and mannequins, and that was the same person that mentioned that. Uh, so uh, then there's a, a, a question from uh, Chris Ainsworth: Could this story and its characters be expanded beyond this novella to possibly a novel or series? Um, yeah, I see at least possibly. I'm actually working on a story now that's uh, focused on someone who actually has a, a phobia of puppets, but um, uh, Elias may make an appearance in this. <laughs> so that further in the recent past and uh, Master of Rods and Stream. Yeah, there is, there is an expansion of narrative there. Oh, that's great. Oh, I see. 19794 is your brother, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. Yeah. Your your parents have an me. interesting way of naming children. Let's see, we have other questions or looks like that was the only other question we had was the one about the expansion of that. I would make so, a comparison uh, in, in mind, but actually um uh like I would say, Mick, your narrator is actually very focused on having that fishing epiphany. He's going to get it. Yeah. yeah. So he's very focused on that in the same way that, you know, Elias becomes very focused on mastering the arts of puppetry. So a kind of obsession at the of relationships is, I think, is it. fishing is an obsession. It is. <laughs> and, and, uh, and people don't do it, don't get it. So. Yeah, yeah I, I really like the uh, when you have him peel back the, the fin. With a nice detail there, where you got your clothes. Yeah, I heard more about fly fishing than I ever knew, and it was very interesting. I, I like the fact that he was a catch and release, especially since this was such a huge fish of this kind that seemed very unusual. So it was nice that they kept on that fish kept on living. Oh, uh, Amanda's right. Grayling don't get very big, so an eighteen-inch grayling is huge. So. <laughs> so, so it was all the more compelling that he had to. You know? He had to catch it. He had to yeah. get it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, let's see. So I don't say. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, was there an intentional writing style, Jason, that you used in telling your story? I was, it was mainly about, you know, the voice of, of that character, which sort of presented itself early on with the, the first sentence. Um, sort of, you know, can be when thinking about the character being obsessed with puppets, you know, like, not deny I've always been fascinated with puppets um, so I sort of tried to keep with that that voice really and um, some of the aspects of that personality and a little bit of sort of becoming reflective and nostalgic about childhood but also that kind of uh, obsessive ambitious arrogance too um, as his sort of abilities grow um, so this aspect of his personality that sometimes would sort of influence the, the writing style based on what he wants to talk about. And when is this set? Is this set like in the 1800s or? So 
it, it is somewhat vague that way. It's, it's actually early 20th century, but it, it's largely rural. It's largely rural, so there's not much interaction with, um, with modern technology. Like there, there, there's a couple mentions later on of more specific things, but um, yeah, early 20th. Okay. In very remote areas of France, mainly. I did, uh, there is another question from Matt McGuire. Jason, did this story go through distinct drafts? If so, how many prior to being accepted for publication? Or would you describe it more as a continual polishing of the root or initial draft? <laughs> and this is rather an insider question because Matt was part of my MFA program back in 2012, 2013, or 2013 2014 in particular. Yeah, I did go through a lot of drafts. Um, at one point, my um, you know, my instructor, uh, Lawrence Coates, had uh, suggested uh, making it shorter, but then he said he liked the longer version better, and I kind of <laughs> continued to expand it. Um, it even got revised uh, in the process of going through through page proofs too. You know, you come across sentences that just aren't doing all they all they might, um, and some things that might be expanded a bit for um, mid to miss. So yeah, it went through a lot. Um, yes, all the way through. It uh, was sort of changing here and there. Go ahead. Uh, all right. Uh, for my story, it was published. It was one of my first stories published back in 1994. And uh, 2014, I was teaching a, a, an advanced fiction class when I was teaching in Kansas. And uh, I decided I, I would demonstrate revision by taking one of my old stories and revising it. And uh, I changed everything around. Uh, the first story was uh, third person. I changed it to first person. And actually, it's so much better now. I'm a better writer now than I was 25 years ago. But, so. so this story is the... is. It's a revision of the one that was originally published years ago. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, and uh, there's just a couple more comments that uh, Jason's brother thought that the guy was not being sensitive to his partner when insisting on going out and spending such an inordinate amount of time fishing. <laughs> oh, he, he totally was. Oh, yeah, absolutely was. Oh, it was. Yeah. He was, he was, that, that's it. That's in question. <laughs> he was obsessed with fishing. There you go. <laughs> but, you know, as Roxanne Gay says, we don't read to make friends. <laughs> so. Well, uh, Trouble in personality is more interesting to read about often. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. If everybody is perfect, then they're usually not as exciting. <laughs> It was. Uh, yeah. I should also mention with, with revision, Matt, um, I, I, I took out, for instance, there were some episodes that actually were in America and, and it's all in France uh, now, but there were some, in the development of it, some things were in America, including Wisconsin. Oh. Yes, but those are all in the cutting room graveyard file now. Yes, yes. maybe for the novel. <laughs> maybe when you expand it into the full novel, you might include something like that. Well, if there's nothing else, I think that might be it. Uh, I, I really enjoyed both of these readings. I'm sure we all did. It was really a pleasure having both of you reading with us. And, and congratulations so much, Jason, on your new book. It's really captivating. And uh, it's, uh, you make me want to finish up and find out what the rest of it is. So I'm glad to know it's in, it's in the store and I'll be able to buy it there. Let me know your reaction when you finish. Okay, we'll do. We'll do. <laughs> Even though it'll kind of keep me awake with all those pup talk of the puppets. So thank y'all so much. And uh, just as an, as I think we've mentioned before, everyone knows that we do have copies of uh, books from both of these authors. So feel free to come by and call Malvern Books. And we'll be happy to give those to you via curbside service. Or if you're interested, we do have personal shopping appointments and you can come in and make an appointment and spend 30 minutes in the store all by yourself. So you'll have all kinds of fun and we can give you personal recommendations and have a chance to shop at the store. So thank you all 